One, two, stats. Those were old shoes. Those were famous in, I think, the 20s or something. Black and white. Didn't they call them stats? They're in Jordan Low Evans. They're what? Jordan Low Evans. Okay. I, I they, know what you're talking about. I think they called them stats back in, back in the 1920s or something. Yeah, shoes like that. But uh, those are really gym shoes, right? I think. Are they, I mean, are they kind of to play sports in them? Yeah. Well, no, just wearing them. So anyway, we're, we're just reviewing here what we went over the other day. And um, so apologetics is defense. And um, most of the things that we believe are based on well, our motive for believing is what? What is our motive for believing? Authority. Our motive for believing? I'm sorry. Raise your hand. I'll call on you. What is our motive for believing? Authority. It's authority. Most of what we believe is based on authority. Oh, okay. Someone tells us something. If we don't have confidence and trust in, in that person, well, then we won't believe it. So uh, most of, of our... What we call faith is based upon authority. Most of our believing, our motive for believing, authority. If the authority is a human being, well then we call it human faith. If the authority is God, we call it divine faith. So the things that we're told from God, we believe them because it is God who tells us these things. That gives us a better motive for believing than if even the person tells us. Because God is more reliable than even the person. Human beings can err. God doesn't err. God is truth. God will not err. And divine faith is a freely willed assent to what God has revealed to us. It comes down to our will, though. God doesn't force us to believe in it. He doesn't twist our arms. God just presents the truth and says, well, here it is. And uh, another motive for believing is that if we believe the things that he says and follow his teachings, well, he makes a promise to us. And is that, do you know what the basic promise is? The fulfillment of the promise that we believe and live according to what he teaches us. What, what does he promise us? What are we all hoping for? In the end, our ultimate goal, what is it? Take a guess. Take a guess. Take yeah. a guess. I want you to take a guess. Okay. Our ultimate goal, the end of our existence, to be where? Go to heaven. Go to heaven. Okay. That's what he promises us. Okay. Now I want another little rule that I have in this class. I don't want you to say I don't know. If I call on you, say something. I want you to think about it. Okay. I don't know is kind of a cop out. You know, anyone can say I don't know. It shows me you're not thinking. I would just want you to think okay, and try to come up with an answer. So, our ultimate goal, God promises us heaven, eternal, eternal life, eternal happiness with Him. And um, that's another good motive for believing God and following what He says. So, but as I mentioned on Friday, in order to put faith in what God tells us about Himself, because we can't see Him, we have to be assisted by grace. His grace that helps he gives us so God will give us grace to help us believe but he doesn't program us to believe he gives us free will so someone can say I believe or I don't believe it's up to them he gives us grace though to help us believe if we don't believe it's our it's our fault because we're choosing not to believe we have a choice to believe or not to believe now there is a famous prayer that I want everyone to memorize. Okay? It's called the Act of Faith Prayer. I want you to use your memories in this class. And I'm going to write an Act of Faith Prayer on the board. Act of Faith.
kind of kind of sums up what I've just been saying. I don't know if it be red. It was black. This is the act of faith prayer. Maybe, how many of you have ever heard of an act of faith prayer? Any of you? Okay. It's this, oh my God, I firmly believe all the truths I will give a shot, okay? Which the Holy Catholic Church saying in this prayer, we're saying God doesn't deceive us. God is not going to lie to us. God is the truth. So if he's revealed things to us, they're worthy of belief. And and Jesus Christ found the Catholic Church to be let's say, the instrument to teach. The church teaches us. That's the attitude. You just memorize that. In fact, you can pray. It's a good prayer to pray. I, I make little kids memorize it. Because they, this helps them uh, to give a motive for believing. Now, we've talked about faith so far. What we haven't talked about yet is um, something called reason. When we talk about reason, um, what are we what are we talking about? Rihanna, when we talk about reason, someone says use your reason, what what do we say? Is there a mind? Okay. Yeah. Common sense, okay. Yeah. Ability to know what's right. Okay, that's that's like what, what are the things say use your reason? Well, we use our reason to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to make judgments about things, okay? And um, I'm going to write um, another definition on the board here. Okay, actually, I'll just, I'll just give it to you. You just write this down, okay? Instead of me writing on the board, I get tired of writing, then I have to erase it. So, I just want you to write this down because. Definitions are important when we talk about reason because people just you know try to define things in different ways. What is reason? The mind in its function of attaining truth. Okay. That's what our reason search searches for. Reason is the mind in its function of attaining truth. Reason. Or you reason is the mind in its function attaining truth. Okay. 
or you could also say the mental process of attaining truth. That's what wisdom is, the mental process of attaining truth. God made us, he gave us a mind into reason to know the truth. Our, our mind thirsts for the truth. We don't want to be lied to. If we're working on a math problem, we want to know what the truth, what, what the answer is. We don't want to, you know, two plus two doesn't equal five. We can say no. That doesn't accord with truth, with reality. Okay? So, reason is uh, using our mind, the mental process of attaining truth, or the mind in this function of attaining truth. God gave us a mind to know the truth. And here's the question, okay? Um, because this is this is more of a philosophic question. Okay? Today there are people out there in the world who say the only truth that we can say is true, truly true, okay, are the things that we can prove by observation, by scientific evidence. Okay? Empirical truth is the only truth. Empirical truth means by, by observation, coming to conclusions by observation, weighing, measuring things. That's the only truth. There are people who claim that this is this is the only truth. The only thing we can be sure of is things we can weigh, measure, observe, okay? Well, is that true? Or is are there other things that are true that we can know by using our reason? For example, okay, um, does God exist? Does the human soul exist? Are we just chemicals and there's no spiritual part of us? Okay. Do angels exist? Can you prove that angels exist? Can you prove that God exists? Yes. Can you prove the human soul exists? Yes. We're going to do that in this class. But we're talking about different order of proof. We're not talking about empirical proof, weighing and measuring. Because why? God is pure spirit. You can't prove that God exists empirically. Okay. You can't do a scientific experiment. Uh, there were there were rationalists back in a couple hundred years ago when when rationalism became popular. Okay, rationalism. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, you say that okay, I I'm a doctor. I I cut open a person after they died, okay, I saw no soul inside. Okay? There's no soul. Well, well, yes. There have been like a lot of clues about this thing though, and I tell you that like a, a lecture about something that's trying to prove it was a God particle. There's a little tiny particle from melanin that really internal cell in the body. It makes up that's basically dominated like for uh, your skin, your organs and all that and the chemical breakdown that goes that blow across. Oh yeah? Okay, well, um, it's true. Okay, okay. Um, but we can't prove that the soul exists by observation. By cutting open a body, okay, there's no soul. There's no, we don't. And actually, science, you know, theoretical physics, you know, they, 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 they don't see these things, they, they theorize them. Okay? They're kind of putting faith in, in what their conclusions are to some extent. But uh, if you're strictly a materialist, okay, uh, well then you believe only in material things and, and you want material proof, you want empirical proof of things. You know? As people of faith, we say, it's not inconsistent to say, we believe in the human soul, we believe in angels, we believe in God, and, but we prove it by different means of proof. We prove it by, by using our reason and using reasoned arguments. And um, we're, we're going to show how it's reasonable to believe in these things. Okay? So um, a bigger question we, we face at the beginning of this class is, are faith and reason opposed to each other? We can say science and faith, reason and science. Okay? 
are they opposed to each other? Science opposed to faith. Does science trump the faith? Okay, now we have science, we throw out the faith. That's what some people thought when the scientific method became popular a couple hundred years ago. Okay, we don't need faith anymore. We have science. It gives us all the answers to everything. Does it? Okay. Does science give us the answer to the meaning of life? What's the meaning of suffering? Does suffering have a meaning? Yes, from a Christian standpoint, we see suffering as, as a share in Christ's suffering. Christ gave meaning to suffering. So, as Christians, there are, there are well, as people of, of many faiths, okay, I can say only Christians, they, they try to answer more, more, um, say, philosophical questions. And science can't answer these questions. I mean, if you're suffering, should, should I be able to end my life? If I'm, if I'm, suffering, if I'm suffering physically, uh, my good friend that I was with for many years, you, you've seen him, Father Reese. Okay? Father Reese is dying. He's in the process of We're all dying. Sense. We all have our days numbered, but he is, he is doing it at in, in, in an accelerated rate because of his uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and uh, you know, he's, he's not going to be able to breathe sometime, probably soon, as long as you're going to be out. Uh, right now, I just saw him about a week and a half ago. He's in a nursing home in St. Louis. He's, he can't even hardly move his fingers to touch Keypad, a touchpad. He just doesn't have the, the ALS breaks down things. So well, he hasn't been able to talk or eat for a year. He's fed on a feeding tube. He's just barely able to walk. And um, it's just going to get worse. So we don't know how long he has. Is there a meaning to all this? Well, if, if you're just a, a, a pure materialist, you say, well, why is he living? He's, he's not having a good existence. Just give him a shot, put him out of his misery. Kill him. Um, that's, that's the final solution. Um, that's actually legal in, in some states. Um, and uh, I think in Belgium, no, the Netherlands, the Netherlands, and I think Belgium too, they, they just passed a law allowing uh, even, even children, eight, nine years old, if they have some type of a disease that's, that's Maybe terminal, maybe just causes them great suffering to say, I want to die, and just give them a shot. Well, as Christians, we would say, no, that's, that's, that's not right. So, science can't answer all the questions. It can't answer the, the deeper questions, the meaning of life, the meaning of suffering. Is, is this earthly existence all there is? Or is there something that comes after us? Science can't answer these questions. Empirical weights and measures and things, they don't give a solution to these deeper problems of the human heart. So that's what we're going to try to look at in this class, apologetics. Apologetics to make a defense that the faith is not opposed to science. The two can go together. You can believe, be a believing scientist. Uh, as a Christian, we can believe in the Big Bang Theory. And that doesn't mean that God is out of the picture. Who caused the Big Bang? That's, that's the question, OK? Can an effect come without a cause? Can an effect come without a cause? Can you have an effect without a cause? So someone must have caused the Big Bang. Um, science doesn't have an answer to that. All science does is can theorize that there's, there's something called the Big Bang. So, in this course, we're going to show that faith, belief in God, the truths he's revealed, and reason are not opposed to one another, okay? especially modern science. And uh, we, we talked about this word truth. You write something in the word. Okay? Uh, that's a D.
quid est veritas. Quid, this is Latin, what is truth? Okay. What is truth? You know who asked that question? Someone very famous asked this question to someone else who was very famous. Okay. As he was standing before him in judgment, you know who asked this question to someone as he was standing before him being judged, you know? Wait, was it like the first time asked to do this It was, Jesus was asked this question by Pontius Pilate. Jesus said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the truth. I'm the way the truth. I'm the light. Pilate says, what is truth? What is truth? He was kind of a skeptic. He can't know the truth. Well, Jesus didn't respond to him. Because Jesus was the truth incarnate. He was the truth made flesh. And Pilate couldn't recognize that there was nothing Jesus could do to make him believe. And Jesus said, The truth will set you free. Um, God tells us he will judge the nations by his truth. We're going to be judged on the truth. What is truth? What is truth? I ask that question because there's an answer to this. Okay. I write this down. I'm not going to write it on the board, but write it in your notes. Okay. Truth is a property of the intellect's judgment. Okay. A property of the intellect's judgment. That's what truth is. I'll just write it short. Property of intellect's judgment. Property of the intellect's judgment. A judgment is true when it corresponds or conforms with reality. So the judgment is true when it conforms to reality or corresponds to reality. That word is a problem too for some people. Okay? Reality. What is reality? What is when we talk about reality? What are we talking about? Well, what's true for you may not be true for me. Okay? Um, some people differ on what reality is. Is God real? Well, for you, God is real. For me, it isn't. Okay? Some people would say. But truth is, is our intellect making a judgment. Okay? And we say that a judgment is true when it conforms with reality. If, if, if I say that um, you know, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't born of parents, I, I was hatched from an egg. Well, most of you would say, well, Father Campbell is not in touch with reality. But if I really believe that, then I shouldn't be standing in front of you and teaching. So, you know, truth, truth is uh, an intellectual judgment that conforms with reality. Our minds are made to know the truth. The debate is what is reality? What is, real, what is real? What is true? So, I'm going to go to another page here today. <clears throat> well, first I'll, I'll give a little quote here. Just, just listen to this. In regard to faith, each person must answer in their heart, how is your faith? What does the Lord find in our hearts? A steadfast heart, like a rock, or a sand-like heart that is doubtful, wary, incredulous, unbelieving? 
the Lord doesn't seek a perfect faith, but rather a sincere and genuine faith that can be used as living stones to build his church. Each baptized person is called to offer to Jesus their own faith, poor but sincere, so that he can continue to build his church in every part of the world. Anything like that? Yes. You would say something like right that. Yes. You would say something like that. He's a, he's a who? Peter. Peter the Apostle. Well, that's, that's not, uh, you're, you're on the right track. Okay. It's Pope Francis. So, 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 what does the Lord want? He wants um, not a perfect faith. You know, he knows none of us are perfect, but uh, a genuine, sincere faith. It's kind of a neat thing that Francis said. So I copied it in order to read it to you. Um, now, we talk about truth and reality. Some truths are self evident. Does that sound familiar to you? Some truths are self evident. From where? Preamble. Okay. We hold these truths to be self evident. That, for example, all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with unalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. So some truths are self evident. I'm going to give you a principle that's, uh, I'm going to say this in Spanish, anyone needs a translation. One of our Spanish speakers. Muy, muy importante. Okay? What that means? A principle that is muy, muy importante, very, very important. Okay? Okay. self-evident principle, okay? And it's this, okay? A thing, okay? A thing can't be true and not true at the same time, okay? same time and under the same circumstances. The thing cannot be true and not true at the same time and under the same circumstances. If I say I am uh, a human being and I am a pig, uh, that can't be true. Both statements can't be true. That's why they contradict one another. I can't say I am male and I am female. I have to be one or the other. I can't say that I have a um, million dollars in the bank, and I don't. One of them has to be true. 
what has to be not true. So the principle of non-contradiction is a self-evident truth. Okay? A self-evident truth. Self-evident. How do you prove the principle of non-contradiction? You can't. You can't prove the principle of non-contradiction. It's, it's something that's so obvious you just can't prove it. It's self-evident. can't say something's true and not true at the same time under the same circumstances. If you do, you're not in touch with reality. You're, you're in a dreamland or something. I just heard today, I was listening to a talk, a guy gave a, this philosopher gave a definition of someone who's neurotic and someone who's psychotic. You know what the difference is? It's pretty good. Someone who is neurotic builds cities in the sky. There's these great ideas. Someone who's psychotic lives in them. They're just out of touch with reality. If, if you are saying that something's true and not true at the same time, under the same circumstances, you're psychotic. You're not just neurotic. You're out of touch with reality. 2 plus 2 equals 4. 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. Both are true. Why? No. It can't both be true. Uh, it's the principle of non contradiction. And that's kind of the starting point of, of our reason. We have a reason, and we know that, that the principle of non contradiction is, is a real principle because we have a reason, a God given reason. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Thomas Jefferson was appealing to people's reason that you know everyone is created equal, even though he kind of fudged on that. You know why he kind of fudged on that? Thomas Jefferson was like, he, he owned slaves. He knew this was a problem. He knew it was a problem, and he, he predicted it was going to be a problem. that were endowed by our creator with unalienable rights. Well, um, even that, people can't see the self-evident nature of that today. Because we have Roe versus Wade, which says that if, if you're an hour, if you're one minute before being born, we, we can kill you in the womb because you're not a person according to the Constitution. So, um, that's think it would be a self-evident truth, but people can willingly you know, reject what is self-evident. So the it's principle of non-contradiction, yes. That actually happened the same day. That's what partial growth abortion is. It's yeah, I never knew that actually happened that soon. Oh yeah, partial growth abortion, you can it's legal in this country to kill a child up until birth. Partial birth is you can take a child halfway out, okay, uh, suck their brains out and then crush the head and then deliver the child. Because that child is not fully born yet, so as long as part of it is in the womb, that's that's what the partial growth of abortion is. Like a few months or so. Yeah. Really bad, right? How much the abortion takes really low though? They only happen because of like the mother who died of baby. No, no, that's that's even a fallacy. That's that's why they passed a law uh, against partial birth abortion because Medically speaking, it never happens uh, with, our, with our medicine today. It's just, it's, it's, it's obsolete. But it's used by people who don't want to have children. If they believe you want, you can kill a child in the womb up until it's born. That is the law of the land right now. And you think that would contradict you know, the self evident principle that you know, human beings have a right to life. Well, we don't consider them human beings until they're out of the womb. That's what the Supreme Court says. That's the law of our okay. So there are problems with this. That's why we need good people in medicine, in law, to change our laws and policies so that they reflect 